Thank you. It is a tribute to good ideas. Can I be heard back there? It is a tribute to good ideas that they enter into public discourse as slogans, mantras that resonate with good will, will but lack substance or bite. There are two such mantras in circulation today. They are notable, first, because they are nonpartisan, invoked by conservatives, liberals, and radicals alike. Second, because they are mouthed with equal facility and conviction by professors, politicians, and journalists. And finally, because they come to us with such respectable and varied credentials as Aristotle and Aquinas, Jefferson and Paine, Burke and Smith, Hegel and Tuckville, and most recently, Clinton and Gingrich. <laughs> These mantras are civil society and community. Now, I don't mean to sound sarcastic or cynical. I myself have used those terms and quoted those authorities. Burke's little platoons, Tuckville's civil associations, and the like. And I believe them to embody important political and social truths, truths that are worthy in their own right, and even worthier as a corrective to the narcissistic mantras of the 60s, liberation, self-fulfillment, doing one's own thing. They are not, however, the whole truth, and the fact that they are all-purpose mantras used interchangeably and indiscriminately by so many, for so many different reasons, should give us pause for thought. Take civil society, for example. There is no question that in the past few decades, an overweening government has usurped the proper functions of civil society. Public relief has displaced private charity, Families have been relieved of the obligation to care for their aged and if also for their incapacitated members. Society can no longer stigmatize behavior, illegitimacy, for example, that the government subsidizes and, in effect, morally legitimizes. And parents find it difficult to urge sexual abstinence upon their children when the schools provide them with condoms and instruct them in their use. There are therefore powerful arguments for what is now called the devolution of power, the transfer of power from the federal government to state and local governments, and more important, from government at all levels to the institutions of civil society. Unhappily, state and local governments are not paragons of efficiency or virtue. And even more unhappily, civil society itself is in a dire condition. And not only because, because it has been weakened by government, but because it has been corrupted by the culture. Some institutions of civil society are in fact flourishing as never before. There are philanthropies and foundations of every description and some of unprecedented wealth there are private schools and colleges, local newspapers, cable stations and talk shows, cultural organizations and public service agencies, and of course, varieties of religious institutions. As often as not, however, these institutions are part of the problem rather than the solution. Civil society has recently been described as an immune system against cultural disease. Unfortunately, it itself has been infected by the same viruses that produced that disease. The principles and practices that have enfeebled our educational system were promoted by some of the most prestigious and powerful institutions of civil society, universities, foundations, trade unions, teachers unions. The most controversial projects funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, Mapplethorpe most notably, have been proudly exhibited in local museums and staunchly supported by the cultural elites of those communities. 
Local cable channels routinely bring hardcore porn into the living room. And even churches, mainstream as well as new age churches, have contributed to the moral laxity of the culture and of society. The family, the bedrock of civil society, is in no better condition. Witness the prevalency of illegitimacy, divorce, and transient relationships, as they are called, of neglected or overindulged children, of dysfunctional families, and of households in which the main cultural vehicle is television with, with its incessant promiscuity, violence, and even sadism. Moreover, civil society has been so fragmented and polarized in recent years as a result of multiculturalism, affirmative action, radical feminism, and racism, black and white, that there is little coherence or commonality left in that society. Instead of being a common ground for the working out of, of common problems, it has become an arena of warring interests and groups. So too that other mantra, community. Now this too is a valuable corrective, not only to an overweening government, but also to an overweening individualism. It did not take the recent emergence of the communitarian movement to apprise us of what ordinary people, and even philosophers, have known for all of human history. That individuals do not exist in isolation, that their very beings are enmeshed in familial and social relations, that they have responsibilities to others as well as rights for themselves, and that their own pleasures and satisfactions are dependent upon the pleasures and satisfactions of others. Except for the most dogmatic libertarian, everyone acknowledges the principle of community. The difficulty comes with its application for it is rarely used in its proper sense to connote a community which, in keeping with its own priorities and resources, is empowered to do what it wants to do for the well-being of its members. More often, the term has become a euphemism for some kind of socialism, socialism with a human face, as is said, or for the welfare state, with communities subsidized by the state to do everything that the state now does. Few communitarians are prepared to make the hard choices necessary to ensure the integrity and viability of communities. They are generally unwilling to circumscribe any of the individual rights that might stand in the way of communal obligations. And they are reluctant to limit the powers of the federal government and to transfer effective authority to the community. Indeed, the idea of community has become, for some of its advocates, a way of evading hard choices, as if the mere invocation of that word reconciles all contradictions and resolves all difficulties. Thus, one prominent communitarian, deploring the fact that, quote, too many people shirk our communal responsibilities, Blythely goes on to say, quote, we need ways to restore the family without reviving a 1950s mentality, to stop criminals and drunk drivers without opening the door even a crack to a police state, to curb the spread of AIDS while protecting privacy. Even the geographic dimension of community has lost all meaning. A few weeks ago in his State of the Union message, President Clinton used the word 15 times by my count. Now, I didn't have a nexus available, so it may be even more than that. But his was a very expansive notion of community. His community embraced the entire country. Near the beginning of the speech, the president explained that he was reporting not on the state of the government, but of the American community. And toward the end, he informed his audience that we must work together as a community, as a team, as one America. 
I was reminded of Governor Cuomo's address to the Democratic Convention in 1988 when he extolled the idea of family. But then it turned out that it was America as one large happy family that he had in mind. Or more recently, there is Hillary Clinton's village, as in It Takes a Village, which comes perilously close at times to being equated with Washington. Let me repeat, I am not quarreling with the ideas of civil society and community. On the contrary, I think they're enormously valuable and extremely pertinent at the present time. But they are necessary, not sufficient conditions for our salvation. It is not enough to call for a restoration of civil society. We also need a remoralization of civil society. And so too, we need a sense of community that will take seriously the ideas of duty, obligation, responsibility, self-discipline, and self-restraint at the expense, if necessary, of both individual rights and of state powers. We need, in short, a remoralization of society. And we need it most urgently, urgently today because we are approaching a state of what I have called in my recent book, demoralization. I distinguished in that book two senses of demoralization. The familiar one of the loss of morale, of contentment and good spirit, and the more serious one of the loss of morality, of moral bearings and convictions. Demoralization in the second sense is associated with what I see as a momentous change in our moral vocabulary, the shift from virtues to values. Virtues, as the Victorians understood that term, and as the classical ph philosophers and the Christian philosophers did before them, were firm, fixed, and certain. If they did not actually govern the behavior of everyone at every time, they were the standards by which behavior was judged. The standards were firm, even if the conduct of the individual did not always measure up to them. And when conduct fell short of those standards, it was deemed to be immoral, bad, wrong, evil, not, as is more often the case today, misguided, undesirable, or the most recent corruption of our moral vocabulary, inappropriate. <laughs> Values, by contrast, are relative, subjective, transient. They are beliefs, opinions, attitudes, sentiments, feelings, whatever any individual, group, or society happens to value at any time for any reason. One cannot say of virtues, as one say one can of values, that anyone's virtues are as good as anyone else's, or that everyone has a right to his own virtues. Although I must say that I heard that only the other day from our leading communitarian, who has apparently now adopted the language of virtue. He urged us to promote the idea of virtue, of a sense of right and wrong. Not, he added, by imposing the virtues of one group upon another, but by learning to appreciate the virtues of everyone else. This change in our moral vocabulary, the demoralization of our vocabulary, has been accompanied by a demoralization of social policy. In recent times, we have deliberately, systematically, divorced poor relief, for example, from any kind of moral sanctions and incentives. This reflects, in part, the theory that society is responsible for all social problems and should therefore assume the task of solving them. And it reflects, in part, the prevailing spirit of relativism, which makes it difficult to pass any moral judgments or impose any moral conditions upon the recipients of relief, or for that matter, upon anyone at all. We are now confronting the consequences of this policy of moral neutrality. 
having made the most valiant attempt to devise policies that are value-free, as we say, that do not stigmatize the recipients of relief or of welfare, we find that these policies imperil both the moral and the material well-being of their supposed beneficiaries. Moreover, they imperil not only the recipients of relief, but the working poor as well. People on welfare often receive more by way of allowances, food stamps, housing subsidies, and medical benefits than workers earning a minimum or modest wage, thus providing incentives to go on relief rather than to seek work or unmarried mothers, including teenagers, get free benefits and services not available to married mothers, thus penalizing marriage and rewarding illegitimacy. We have demoralized our rhetoric together with our policies. We go to great lengths to avoid any suspicion of moral disapprobation or stigmatization, which is itself, by the way, a taboo word. Relief has become welfare. Illegitimacy is officially known now as non-marital childbearing or alternative mode of parenting. I must tell you that I discovered this rather than when I was working on my book, and I wrote a government agency for the latest statistics on illegitimacy, and I received a letter rebuking me very sharply. We do not use that term, I was told. And that's when I discovered those wonderful terms non-marital childbearing or alternative mode of parenting. Promiscuous teenagers are said to be sexually active. The Department of Prisons has been renamed the Department of Correction, and juvenile criminals are delinquents. We think we have devised a value-free vocabulary in keeping with our value-free policies. In fact, we have substituted one value-laden rhetoric and policy for another. We have, in effect, legitimized illegitimacy, that is, morally legitimized it, by calling it an alternative mode of parenting, and then by rewarding that alternative mode with material benefits unavailable to married, self-supporting parents. Similarly, we have morally legitimized teenage prom promiscuity by labeling it sexually active, implying that the unpromiscuous is somehow deficient in the normal complement of hormones, I suppose. And then by providing teenagers with contraceptives to indulge their socially sanctioned activity. The demoralization of our rhetoric and our policies has been accompanied by a serious demoralization of our society. If we were in any doubt about that, we need only look at the statistics of crime, violence, drug addiction, illegitimacy, welfare dependency. Moral statistics, the Victorians called them. It is instructive to compare our moral statistics with those of the Victorians. Take illegitimacy, for example. In Victorian England, illegitimacy fell from 7% at its peak in 1845 to 4% by 1900. It hovered between 4 and 5% for most of the first half of the 20th century, and then rose, both in England and in America, from 5% in 1960 to 32% today a decline of almost 50% in the last half of the 19th century, an increase of more than 600% in the past three decades of the late 20th century. It is sometimes said that our present moral condition is the result of the economic and technological changes to which we have been subject in recent years. But the Victorian period was hardly a tranquil one. If we today are going through the trauma of a post-industrial revolution, the Victorians went through the no less traumatic experience of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the Industrial Revolution was far more consequential 
for it was not only an economic and technological revolution, it was also a political revolution and a social revolution and an urban revolution. Yet the Victorians survived those momentous changes without experiencing any moral crisis, indeed with an accession of morality. To understand the character of the Victorian ethos, we have to go back in time to the Wesleyan revival in the 18th century. Wesleyanism was remarkable in several respects. From the beginning, it was as much a movement for moral as for religious reform. That is, it was as much an ethic as a creed. And the ethic itself had two aspects, the old individualistic Puritanic, Puritan ethic of work, thrift, temperance, self-reliance, self-discipline, and a social ethic of good works and charity. Thus, the Wesleyans established societies for the care, this is in the uh, late 18, in the 18th century and the early 19th century, uh, societies for the care of abandoned children, destitute governesses, shipwrecked sailors, penitent pr prostitutes, and so on. They founded schools, hospitals, and orphanages. They led the movements for prison reform, for the abolition of the slave trade, and for child labor and factory laws. And they did all of this as a religious, as much as a moral obligation. The other remarkable aspect of this religious come moral revival was the, the fact that it affected all classes of England. The Methodists who left the Church of England appealed primarily to the working and lower middle classes, while the evangelicals remaining in the church attracted the middle and upper classes. But whatever their differences, they shared a common ethic that transcended both class and sectarian lines and political lines as well. It was as much the ethic of the radicals and socialists as of liberals and conservatives. It is often said that the British Labour Party was born in the chapel. In the course of the 19th century, to be sure, the religious impulse, especially among the educated, uh, became somewhat attenuated, but the moral fervor remained. Indeed, it was intensified as if to compensate for the loss of religious zeal. This secular ethic expressed itself most dramatically in George Eliot's famous dictum. God, she said, is inconceivable, immortality unbelievable, but duty nonetheless peremptory and absolute. It was this ethic, born of religion, and retaining, even in its secularized form, all the authority and passion of religion that helped preserve the moral character of England in a period of intense economic and social change. And not only the moral character of the people, but the institutions that we now associate with civil society and community. Morality is not yet a problem, Nietzsche wrote in 1888, but it would become a problem, he predicted, when the people discovered that without religion there is no morality. The English flatheads, this was his term for uh, George Eliot and John Stuart Mill, the English flatheads thought it possible to get rid of the Christian God while clinging all the more to Christian morality. They did not realize, Nietzsche wrote, that when one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. A century later, morality is indeed a problem, perhaps our most serious problem, for a host of reasons, economic, technological, social, that even Nietzsche could not have foreseen. But foremost among them is surely his explanation the death of God and the death of morality. In retrospect, one might say that Victorian England and Victorian America as well were living off the moral capital of religion and that post-Victorian England and America well into the 20th century were living off the capital of a secular morality once removed from religion. <laughs> 
perhaps what we are now witnessing is the moral bankruptcy that comes through the depletion of both the religious and the quasi-religious capital. Today, the question that insistently confronts us is, can we reverse the deterioration in our social and moral condition? The old economic and political answers no longer avail. Four years ago, the Democratic Party derided Vice President Quayle when he introduced the idea of family values. Today, President Clinton unashamedly invokes that phrase. For good me measure, he assures us that, quote, the era of big government is over and that we must look to civil society and community for some of the solutions to our problems. I repeat, I have a high regard for civil society and community, perhaps a higher regard than does President Clinton. But I am disturbed by the way these ideas are often misused and abused. I have just read, for example, a 70-page transcript of a symposium held recently on the need for a revitalization of civil society. And I was struck by the fact that 20 or so very intelligent people who had devoted considerable time to that subject managed to discuss it without ever mentioning some of the most important institutions of civil society, that is, the churches. There was no mention of religion in the whole of this transcript of the proceedings of this conference. And this is true, I regret to say, of most of the academic books and articles now extolling the virtues of civil society and community. To a historian, this omission is remarkable. If we look to the past for examples of a moral reformation, the most obvious ones are Christianity, the Protestant Reformation, the Wesleyan Revival, and the periodic Great Awakening movements in the United States. It is no accident, it seems to me, that all of these were religious come moral movements. Nor is it an accident that the Puritan ethic which celebrates such secular virtues as work, thrift, temperance, responsibility, that ethic comes to us with that religious label. It is known to us as the Puritan ethic. Whatever the philosophical rationale, and there is a perfectly respectable one for a purely secular ethic, the fact is that historically, the most important movements of moral reformation originated as religious movements. And I might add the most successful uh, organizations for personal moral uh, reformation, uh, such as uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Until a few years ago, one might have thought that an age as resolutely secular as ours could not sustain a serious religious revival. The emergence of what is called the religious right should give us pause. The name is deceptive. It suggests a far greater political homogeneity than actually exists, and it obscures the extent to which it is a movement for moral, cultural, and social reform, as well as for religious piety. But the phenomenon itself is undeniable. One of the extraordinary experiences of recent years has been the mass meetings in city after city of promise keepers, 50,000 or more men assembled for an entire day of prayer, pledging themselves to familial responsibility and marital fidelity, and paying for the privilege of doing this. This religious revival may well turn out to be confined to a small minority, yet it may prove to be, again like all such revivals, disproportionately important in the public life of the country. And it may be all the more important if, following the example of the Victorians, the religious reformers find common cause with secularists on such crucial, critical issues as the need to strengthen the family, to curb illegitimacy, to deter violence and crime, and to discourage welfare dependency. All of this takes time. <clears throat>
it is much harder to remoralize society, or an individual for that matter, than to demoralize it. It took a century for the Wesleyan revival to bear fruit in Victorian England, but that did finally happen. And it happened because the Victorians brought all the resources of society, religious and secular, private and public, civic and governmental, to bear upon their social problems. And I think it is beginning to happen here. Not only are we contemplating reforms that were unthinkable only a few years ago in welfare, Medicare, education, criminal justice, taxation, we are thinking about them in ways that were once unthinkable. We now, or at least some of us now, dare to use the language of morality, to apply that language to social problems, to speak not only of values, but even of so retrograde, so Victorian an idea as virtues. When William Bennett first came up with the idea for the Book of Virtues, his publisher objected strenuously to the title. The Book of Values, he wanted to call it. But it is the Book of Virtues, not Values, and in my opinion, precisely because it was a Book of Virtues and not Values, that has sold over two million copies and is still going strong. For me, the moment of epiphany came a few months ago when Newsweek, a journal of impeccable liberal credentials, appeared with the word shame emblazoned on the cover and below it the question, how do we bring back a sense of right and wrong? More recently, Colin Powell asked what his agenda would have been had he chosen to run for the presidency, replied, to restore a sense of family, restore a sense of shame in our society, help bring back more civility into our society. A Victorian could not have put it better. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're, you draw some marvelous lessons from the Victorians, uh, but one great difference between England and America is, of course, England's class structure. Um, and so I'm wondering whether you've ever thought about uh, American analogs of the Victorians. And the, the one that I would like to suggest is some of the 19th century black political thinkers, like Frederick Douglass and mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington. And I'm wondering whether you've uh, thought about uh, using them as resources in our uh, current, uh, uh, current questions. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. Uh, this is one of the things that I found so interesting in doing this book. My own background, of course, is in England, not in, in America. Uh, and yet I found when I wanted to, when I was thinking about our current situation here, I found infinite parallels between the English situation and ours in full recognition of the fact that our societies are so different historically uh, and socially in terms of its class structures, you've pointed out, and so on. And one of the reasons I made this point about this Wesleyan ethic which was really the Victorian ethic, cutting across class lines was precisely to make that point. It is often said that the virtues that I talk about when I talk about Victorian virtues are middle class virtues. They're bourgeois virtues. They were held by only a small number of people. The upper classes, of course, had nothing to do with them, and the working classes were quite exempt uh, from them. That is simply not true. Uh, the working classes adhered to these values which is not to say that, uh, to these virtues, which is not to say that they were always able to live up to them, but neither were the middle classes. I mean, no one's ever able to live up to these virtues. Aristotle did not think that, that, his, that, that his society uh, actually lived up to their virtues, but they were the standards that were accepted by all classes. That is what I found so interesting about England, and that's one of the things that made it so applicable to the American experience. And I hadn't particularly thought in terms, you know, in the terms that you suggest, but I'm sure that you would, that one would find almost exactly that situation here. Comparable people saying comparable things and doing comparable things. <laughs>
the other thing I found so interesting about the English and American experience, which I was totally unprepared for, I had never done any of this kind of number crunching in my earlier work, but I suddenly found myself having to substantiate my sense of what was happening to the society by using numbers. You know, what, what were the statistics telling us? instead of the so-called impressionistic evidence that is really what the literary evidence, which is generally what I prefer. And one of the things I found was how closely the two countries parallel each other. Now, the, I cannot get, one cannot get, no one can get firm statistics for America in the 19th century on illegitimacy, uh, crime, and so on, because we simply didn't have national statistics. But even from the local statistics, from the partial statistics that we had, we can see that the, that the lines that were, were, they were very similar in both countries, that the two countries paralleled each other. And what is even more remarkable is that in this late 20th century, the figures are almost identical except for a couple of measures. I and mean, we are way out of line on... Uh, um, um, on murder statistics, for example, homicides, way out of line uh, with that of any other country. Uh, but apart from that, illegitimacy is almost exactly comparable in the two countries, which is so interesting in view of our very different racial background, class composition, and so on. So the two countries had more in common than, than we had thought, and I think what they had in common was a a, a common religious tra tradition, a common heritage, a, a common uh, tradition of civil institutions.